watching it ascend, I find myself ascending. And what is even more fascinating is that all that splendor lay hid in a small packet of potential chemical energy, waiting to be liberated. So verily, potential energy is joy, even if you don't understand it. I grew up as a child in northern India. In the summer heat, the land there used to turn into a brown dust of, you know, big sheet of brown dust. And one always found it hard even to move because of the heat. But it also brought a welcome gift of uh, mango crops in that season. And as they get a little mass, which means a little potential, mass times gravity times the elevation, there'll always be some on the ground. And the prospect of finding some in the morning spurred a morning run to the mango grove. Mangoes, as you know, are very special kind of fruits. You know, they're, they're lovely to eat at any stage of their ripening. And I found the little green ones especially exciting. Astringent to the tongue, you know, they send a shiver through the body. The days, I remember, were quite hot because most of the energy was drained producing the sweat in order to keep the body cool. But in the evening, I'll run up on a little mound, something looking like this, an earthen mound, you could imagine it as an upturned pond, reversing its potential energy from negative to positive. Sitting there, I love to watch the interplay of the refracted red colors, you know, shot by the sun as it slid below the horizon languidly to light the other side of the earth. But coming down, I always chose the shortest path. I just slid down along one of those I was thrilled to the bone. But these childhood thrills are not easy to explain. Natural philosophers millennia ago recognized that thrill as something like a joy of discovery that a child experiences on seeing the face of mother, for example, or finding the hidden friend in, a, in, a, in the game of hide and sleep, seek. And this was translated into a schema for discovering laws of nature, and it was called the scientific method. And what is the method? That you think of possible explanations to describe a phenomena which you may be studying or debating about, and then design experiments to see our observations as to which one of these possible answers is really correct. So here is an example which I thought I'll share with you. In Newton's days, that was quite some time ago, of course, and you know Sir Isaac Newton. So it wasn't very clear as to where those rainbow colors came from. Did they come from the prism? Did the prism generate them or is it from the white light? So there were possible answers, not just one answer at least two answers. So what he did, what did he do? He decided to test this hypothesis that it is really composed of white light and not coming out of the prism because he argued that if the prism is generating it, the white light coming there is stimulating the prism and the prism is bursting into joy and creating its own rainbow lights. Then if you pass those rainbow lights, through another prism, God knows what that prism will do. But if it is coming on the white light, and if I use an inverted prism, then of course it will give me the white light back. So you know that experiment, and you see this process work. Well, I don't know whether that process is the real process whereby all discoveries are made. But later on, slowly, scientists discerned that there were two major principles 
which were evident in all the works of nature, and they were unexceptional. They were never violated, and one of them was the principle of least action, which implied that in all of nature's works, the course that it follows is that which has minimum expenditure of energy. Imagine, you know, what a metaphor for the world that we live in, and if we learn really to apply it in every little detail in our lives, we could still deflect the Earth from the perilous course it is heading to. That least action principle is one of the guiding principles in the universe, and it was a beautiful one. No waste. And the second was symmetry, which implies that you have the same view from all viewpoints. There are no favored conditions. There are no favorites. That too is a very good metaphor for society. Shed your prejudices. Treat everyone identically, no matter what one's creed, religion, or whatever it is. The sun shines, radiating its energy equally in all directions. And that is why the inverse square law is so reliable. And if we didn't have the inverse square law, we wouldn't understand what we know now about the universe and so many of its processes. So these two principles are really the reigning edict of the universe. And what is remarkable is that they hide between themselves hundreds of other laws that are seen to work everywhere in nature and which we can use and apply by understanding them to make fans and air conditioners and lifts and various other things. So those are the laws which are, which are omnipresent everywhere. And you see this, uh, this beautiful thing here. If you throw a stone, it, you know it describes a parabola. It goes up and, and goes up. And why does it do that? Because that fairy of least action is pulling it in just the right direction, not violating it at any instant of its journey till it falls. And see how symmetrical it is. It's also the same principle that you see working here, producing the rainbow. And what is that doing? Law of least time. The minimum time that the ray will take to go from point one to point B. Just that circumstance requires that it should bend when it is crossing regions of different velocities so that it spends more time going in the region which has high velocity and less that has low velocity. That's Snell's laws. How do rainbows know Snell's laws? But you see, this is what happens. And one of the remarkable corollaries of these two laws were that the energy is conserved all along that projectile or rainbow. If you sit down and calculate what are the energies, you will find it remains constant throughout its journey. There is no violation. Isn't that wonderful? Because if there were, then we won't be able to have any handle as to how to design our own world. We design our world by using those very laws that we have discerned from these. So conservation implies that energy is neither destroyed nor created. It can only be transformed. It can be transformed in one form to another form. And you have seen over the last half an hour how potential energy of, of human sensibilities have been transformed into dance, into music, into just you know, radiating yourself in a hundred different ways, depending on how you take it. So, potential energy is the energy which is there, which is latent, which is hidden, which is ready to burst out when it is liberated. But when it bursts out, it changes forms. And the classic example is which you must know that the sun, for example, creates photosynthesis. And what is happening when, this, when the sun's energy strikes a chlorophyll molecule. What it does, it makes the electrons dance. They dance in a manner which produces a slope, another, another potential energy of proton gradient. And protons begin to flow and they go and hit 
this carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is hyd hydrogenated to carbohydrates, and carbohydrates is what supports the rest of us, the entire world. And the carbohydrates under cert certain conditions will become hydrocarbons, gasoline, kerosene, uh, and, and petrol. And even that potential energy hidden in that packet of gasoline or whatsoever can be converted into joy. You can have a joy ride, for example, here. One can have a joy ride by having a, having a car in which to put that gasoline, or you could even convert it into money and buy other joys. So there it is, the potential energy. Where it has come from, it has come from the sun, and it goes on creating other potential energies. So there's a cascade of potential energies, even though some is lost at every stage of this creation. So you might ask, where was the first potential energy? Where did it come from? Well, for a long, long time, when time didn't exist, a gigantic ball of energy drawing up all space-time into itself lay dormant for liberation. It lay waiting there. And suddenly, and we know it when it happened because time is started at that time, and we have learned how to measure that. 14 billion years ago. You know, a billion has nine zeros. So many, so many years ago, that ball suddenly burst. It's energy expanding, cooling, crystallizing into matter. Till it cooled so much that it couldn't crystallize into matter because M has to E be equal to E over C squared. And when E falls because it's cooling, then M starts, it stops being created. So you will see here, uh, I didn't move on, you see. Over there. So this was the ball of energy which exploded and it started, it started that infinite sequence of cascading one kind of potential energy into another kind of potential energy. And that is how from the da frenzied dance of from the frenzied dance of photons to galaxies, planets, and consciousness, like I said, even cockroaches. All has come by the infinite running down of one kind of potential energy, creating another in the process, and on and on and on. So you can imagine how critical potential energy is and you can see it happening all around you whenever anything is happening. Some energy is being converted into another form of energy. So this was that ball of uh, fire, and this is a schematic which has been made by a guy from Australian uh, National University, how it explodes and creates these various kinds of things. And the first explosion went like this, and you can see how it's exploding with the same intensity in every direction, symmetry, no favoritism, and how that same process has led us from that point in time, which we can count as zero, because we don't know what happened before that time, to where we are. Well, our own Earth took another 10 billion years to emerge from this continual process of changing potential energy of one form into another form. And look what it started doing. Fantastic things. It had, of course, its uh, dowry of potential energy in the form of matter, in the form of radioactivity that it had, which will keep on producing the heat in, in its interior, and thereby you know, providing the kind of energy, potential energy that will run engines, as the Earth also run engines uh, within itself, as you will see here. This is the engine of the Earth called plate tectonics, which some of you might have heard about. Constantly moving oceans and continents over the surface of the globe and changing their configuration. So this is the thermodynamic engine. It also has, when it was born, it was promised to have its daily share of energy from the sun. And that it has, and it converts and uses that potential energy in a million ways, 
from photosynthesis, which creates these packed molecules of potential chemical energy, which we ingest in order to produce the energy of what I'm doing and what uh, young people were doing a little while ago and, and what is done in order to produce the sweat, even if it is to cool the body, so that our, our, our temperature, we don't become too hot to live. And, and you can see all this, uh, how the winds are moved, because the Earth is heated unequally by the sun, although the sun radiates symmetrically, but the sun-earth axis is not symmetrical with respect to the Earth. And at the poles, it's colder than at the equator, and therefore, at the hotter place, the air rises, when it rises, it draws the air from other way, and so a circulation starts. This moves the oceans, and the oceans' evaporated waters move on the land, they rise up to the mountains, and the earth has taken care to see that it can raise mountains because it has this internal energy which has raised these mountains. So how this internal energy and external energy that we receive every day, how they combine to produce this miracle of running waters, for example. Imagine if we had no running waters, there'd be no crops, and there would hardly be any, any life. And the running water, not only produces rivers, it comes from the glaciers, beautiful places to go and have a little holiday, and waterfalls. And sometimes you can use waterfalls to produce energy. Over here, by putting a hydroelectric and, and, and make our world like this. So you can see what has happened from that photosynthetic energy on the one hand, and the wind energy, on the other hand, this entire world that our Earth has fashioned and human beings have come out of it, who have in turn fashioned another world superimposing on it, unfortunately, in a manner, you know, which is not always very nice to see. Uh, when we have waste everywhere, desecrating our land, making it ugly, and, of course, our environment, uh, which becomes not so nice to breathe in. So this is how the Earth works. Have you ever wondered as to what happens when energy is transformed? It's the transfer of electrons. It's the motion of molecules. I've always wondered. And therefore, when Rahul asked me if I would come and talk to you here, I thought, let me see if other people have also wondered about it. And lo and behold, I did find someone, this very creative guy in the University of Southern California, not long ago, only last year. He made a system whereby he could actually photograph the dance of the electrons as energy was transferred from one part of the bacterium to another, which is shown on the right. It's, a, it's an image actually produced and you see the image on the right, human beings, as if the external manifestation of this potential energy is in resonance with the internal world. And I think that's very important. And it has a big lesson for us. And that lesson is joy. It's the energy poised to liberate itself, like the big ball at the time of the Big Bang. by moving, dancing, transforming, and creating. So leap up to make a creative change into something rich and strange.